Great. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, is everybody still awake? Yes. <laughs> I'm so happy. I, I can imagine that it's the adrenaline of being at CERN, at CERN, that like gives that kick to this entire day and that hopefully helps you with this last session as well. I'm beyond thrilled to be here. Like uh, today, we actually had like uh, a tour. Like, who? How many of you guys went also on a tour during lunch? Like around that time? Not, not that many people. Okay, I think there are still some spots for tomorrow. So uh, check that out. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty amazing to be here. And in uh, this last session of today, we're going to look a little bit on how our brain is wired. And that might feel quite related to CERN, right? Wired, um, but we're not exactly going in that atomical level <laughs> of how our brain is working, even though neurons are, of course, also built up of atoms, uh, which makes sense. But we're going a little bit a level up, uh, a little bit functional, maybe a little bit more applicable to all of you guys as well. So in this afternoon, we're talking about how our brain is learning new languages or new coding languages for the matter. Now you might wonder, who am I to tell you about this? Well, I studied and uh, graduated as a speech and language therapist, uh, but I switched immediately after to IT and I work currently for Open Value. Oh, is this my, wait. Do you like the, the, <laughs> the chilling music? No, I don't think I. It, I don't think it's me. Let me check. Is next room? Ah, okay. Okay. No, never mind. Maybe maybe it helps you guys focus. Um, get, am I back on the screen? No. Huh? I don't see anything happening yet. Ah, yes. Okay. Okay, sorry guys for the distraction. I, I, I have like the same kind of focus music, which I just had on before this talk to like practice my talk. So I was like, oh, maybe that is still on. But um, yeah, without further ado, let's get started. Um, and I have the slide on here all the time when I give this talk, but it's even more relevant now because it's the end of the day. You guys already had a lot of talks and are probably mentally quite a little bit tired, uh, even though we might not want to admit it. So uh, at any given time, I would highly recommend you to take out an external memory device, and that can be a laptop, a mobile phone to take notes, a notepad, just uh, whatever suits you, just to remember or write stuff down so you can remember or take a look back a little bit later. So talking about memory storage, well, we're going to look at the memory storage that we have inside our brain. And the first memory storage that we come across is the sensory memory. And the sensory memory takes in everything that happens around us and that what's taken in by our senses. So that can be sight, touch, uh, whatever you hear, whatever you taste, stuff like that. And it might not surprise you that you see me, you see the screen, uh, like you're probably not surprised that there is a sensory memory, but what most people don't really fully um, uh, realize is the fact that we take in so much more than only what your attention is pointing towards. So if I now ask you to keep looking at me or keep looking at the screen, whatever, um, and Keep looking, and now I ask you, can you please tell me the color of your neighbor's shirt or your neighbor's sweater? Oh, no, 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 without, without turning your head. No, no, <laughs> cheating there. <laughs> Probably you can. Maybe if you're like single in the row, then it's quite hard. But like if there's someone quite close next to you, you probably can tell the shirt of that neighbor. And that is because we take in so much more. So when you compare that to IT, it looks a little bit like dot folders. They are there, but we hardly are aware of it. Only when we bring it to our attention and we show them, we, they become visible to us. Now, when things become visible to us or when it gets to our attention, it ends up in the next storage. And that is the short-term memory. 
Now, we might all know this cute little fish, right? Dory. She is humble, she is kind, she is helpful, super energetic and happy, but she has this eeny, meeny, tiny problem, and that is that she forgets almost everything that happened before the here and now. So you can have a conversation with her about this room or about here or now, but nothing that happened in the past. So it looks like she has only her short-term memory to rely on. And if we compare that to IT, it looks a little bit like a RAM disk. It is a small storage place with limited amount of data for a limited amount of time. And that is very true for our short-term memory. Recent research has shown that an adult brain can only take up about two to six chunks at the time, with a time to live for approximately 30 seconds. That is very limited. <laughs> but what is a chunk? Now, a chunk can be anything. A chunk is, real, is based upon your previous knowledge. So a chunk can be a letter, a chunk can be a word, it can be an entire concept. So let's take an example. Let's look at this line of code. Now, if I would cover it up and I would ask you to rewrite that line of code, I bet most of you would have quite a hard time reconstructing the entire line of code. Probably you would get to the string because you're all quite familiar with it, so it gets chunked into one chunk. But the other letters I chose very randomly. They don't make any sense. For me, as a Dutch person, the O and the A make the sound U in Dutch. So my brain would probably cluster them together, meaning I only take up one chunk for that letter. But we don't get to the end of the line. With that in mind, we need to be careful of using abbreviations while we're writing code. And that is because, as developers, most of our time is unfortunately not spent on writing code, it's spent on reading code, maintaining code, understanding code. And so when you choose a variable name that might be very short for yourself, think about everyone that's coming after you and that needs to understand the code using their short-term memory to process and understand everything that's written down in that class or even the entire code base. So, looking at the next line of code, even though the line of code in characters is longer, it doesn't take up as many chunks as it, as it did before, right? Because we, we already know the concepts. Now, if you would use and introduce design patterns, you can even like make that more effective. Let's say every time we use the data type Boolean, we start our variable name with the verb is. Then we can even cluster those two together, making sure that we're using as little chunks as needed. But still, like it's all nice and dandy, but we can only do too much. <laughs> we only have six chunks, so you can be a little bit efficient, but yeah, we really need something else, otherwise we all end up like little dories, right? <laughs> so there's luckily a bigger storage, the long-term memory. And I have another Disney analogy for you here, uh, the elephants of Jungle Book. They swear that they never forget. And in that sense, it looks a little bit like a hard disk, right? It's a place where you can store a lot of data for an indefinite period of time. Very useful. But how does it end up there? And how is it that I sometimes cannot reach it? Well, think of it as a forest. You stand in front of an untouched forest. No one has ever been there. So the first time you make your way through it, you need to like push away the branches, you need to step over all the tree roots. It's quite a hard way, right? And when you revisit that same spot, let's say a week after, even though you still have the scratches on your arm to prove you were there, the path is gone. It has re-overgrown already. It's only when you revisit that path of time after time again that at one point there will form or consolidate a path. 
But now I have something cool for you guys to, to tell you. Like I think it's one of the coolest things that research has shown us and that I'm going to tell you in this talk. Please don't leave afterwards <laughs> because I'm not done. But the cool thing is that recent research has shown that once memory ends up in the long-term memory, we never forget things. We only fail to retrieve it. So tell that to your partner when you forgot the milk. You don't forgot it, you just failed to retrieve it. Yes. Now, sometimes when we learn new things, new concepts, new words, it's harder, one term or concept is harder than the other one, right? So, of course, that has to do with how our memory is structured, how everything is saved. So, it is like a network structure, like a, a structure of all the words and concepts we know and they are tied together with little hooks, with little pathways, making connections, etc. So, if we're this person, this person knows all of these words and this person wants to learn about the new concept of a tiger. Would that be easy for this person to learn about the word tiger? Yeah, pre pretty much, probably. He knows al already a lot of things that are related to the tiger. So he can easily hook that to what he already knows. Very different from when he, when he wants to learn about an animal called a pigeon. A flying animal, you say? No, never heard of that. No, no, no. So that will be take a lot longer for him to settle in, to really understand the concept and what it belongs to. Now this mind map or this network structure isn't built up only out of words. No, it's an entire structure with also our senses included. So when you want to learn a kid about a dolphin, you're not only going to tell the kid about how a dolphin looks like and, and where it lives and stuff like that. No, you're also showing it in a book or showing it on video or maybe even going to a place where they can see the dolphin in real life. Because that's how it sticks. It's because every time you integrate an extra sense is as you connect an extra hook to that term. So that's very nice, um, but how do we use that? Well, as linguists, we call it contextual association. So when we learn, we integrate multiple senses into our learning process. And as developers, we can do that as well. So who upgraded already to Java 21? Okay, okay, not too bad, not too bad. Um, nice. Um, so let's say you're on tw Java 21, you want to have all the cool new features. Um, so you learn or you heard something about virtual threats, right? So you, you need to have that. You want to learn about it so you can integrate it into your own system. Well, we're off to a good start. Because naming wise, it already takes up less amount of chunks than if I want to learn about Sun Peaky CS11, which is like a very hard term for me to even remember. Um, but virtual threads are not too bad, so that, that's already a good start. I can probably hook that to what I already know in terms of like phon uh, phonetically um, connected to stuff I know. But then, of course, I also want to know what it means, right? Because otherwise it doesn't really make sense. So I figured this um, um, meaning on, or I found this meaning on the internet. I wrote it down. I wrote some semantical meanings. I wrote down how I can use it, some grammatical rules, uh, some syntax rules. And now what? How am I going to integrate my senses into this learning process? Well, first off, we can simply start by repetition, by speaking it out loud. So whenever you read an article, instead of just reading it via your eyes, start making it a habit to speak it out loud. You will probably recognize, or maybe you already know this, that it will stick with you 
a lot easier and a lot quicker than if you would only read it through your visual sight. And that is simply because whenever you read it, you're processing it once via your eyes, via your iconic memory. So you're processing it, but when you speak it out loud, there comes this extra step, right? You're also speaking it. You're also using that other sense. And that actually triggers the third sense because when you speak it, you also hear it again. So it's like this efficiency um, extra benefit that highly improves your learning strategy or your learning techniques. Now you can also do that with writing stuff down, like you probably remember when you were at college or maybe high school or something. When you wrote a summary of like your class, it always already was half of the process of getting the test uh, or, or getting the test to pass. But of course, like with a dolphin, it's quite hard, right, to find something else, like a visualization or something, that you can connect to that meaning or not. Well, in linguistics, we call this creative contextual association, uh, and that is that it doesn't matter at all. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if this connection is a real connection. Who has heard of the mind palace? A mind palace, who heard of it? Not that many people. Okay, uh, let me explain it to you. A mind palace is a learning technique where whenever you want to learn something, you are connecting it to an imaginary room in your head. So let's say you are in a living room and you want to learn about virtual threats and I'm connecting it to the book that's laying on top of the table. Even though that book has absolutely no correlation to the concept that I'm learning, because I tie it together, there's an extra hook in my network structure making it easier to recall the next time I want to think or integrate virtual threads and I'm not entirely sure what the rules were again. I just need to think about that book in that room and I, and I retrieve it with more ease. The only rule that you need to apply here is that you have just one visualization per context. So don't make that book both your reference for virtual threads and for records in Java 17. Like, it needs to be separated because otherwise your brain, just like the pathway in the forest, doesn't know which path to take if it both ends up in a different direction. Now, as a speech and language therapist, I, of course, worked a lot with kids. And the cool kid, the thing with kids is that they learn intuitively. They learn effortlessly. They haven't learned any learning strategies, they just do. And that is where I think we can greatly benefit because a lot of times learning feels hard, but it doesn't always need to be hard if we know how we can learn in the most efficient way, like kids do. So the first thing kids start to do whenever they enter this earth is they're going to parrot stuff. They're going to repeat things they see around them. Um, maybe like with mimics, but also of course with words. Now this is very cute when, when they start like repeating mommy and daddy. It's a little bit less cute when they get to the swear words. <laughs> That's like not, not, not too nice, but yeah, it happens. And I'm here to tell you that we do it as well. We all use our buddies, Stack Overflow, and ChatGPT, right? That are our parroting mechanisms. But I need to make one big remark here. It is only parroting when you apply an active way of learning, because parroting is an active way of learning. And that means that when a kid is seeing something or hearing something around them, they're passively taking it in and they're actively reproducing that same mimic or that same word, which is active learning. When you use Stack Overflow or JetGPT and you're reading it and then you're simply copy pasting it, it's not parroting. It's a passive way of learning. And the chances that it will stick with you 
um, are like s very quickly decreasing. So if you want to use this as a parroting tool, be sure to have your Stack Overflow, your ChatGPT on one screen and your in IntelliJ, Eclipse, whatever, on the other screen and just typing it out, let it run through your fingers, actively apply what you read on the other page. Now, the second thing kids do is they try stuff out. Whenever they learn a new word, like a cat, they're going to call every animal a cat because they need to try it out. Like, what is a cat? What is the concept of a cat? They need to have the hooks or they create the hooks to really understand when something is a cat and when something is a dog. And they only can do that with getting like feedback on that process, right? But that is how we deepen our understanding of a certain concept. And that's what we also should do in IT. When you're looking for something or you're trying to learn something, don't simply go for the first solution that you're finding on the internet, if you want to really understand what you're typing and what you're creating. Try to see how you can fit it in the different solutions. Now, as I already mentioned, we do need to be careful of uh, learning stuff that isn't true. If the kid would parrot and the kid would try stuff out and no one would correct him, then that, the, the kid's view on reality would be fairly different from the reality that we all face. Or at least he would have a very different vocabulary of stuff. And as I already told you, we never forget things. So the act of forgetting something is not really about forgetting it, it's rather letting the old pathway you have overgrow again and letting the correct solution or the correct meaning like clear out and consolidate. And that's quite hard, right? Because if you're in the process of letting the old pathway overgrow and creating this new pathway, you come at a stage that you have two pathways which are like all, both of them are there and they're both kind of like not really visible but a little bit so you don't know which one to take. So it's an efficient <laughs> process so be sure that you find something, someone that can guide you, can mentor you but also be careful of bad examples and especially with the use of generative AI nowadays. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, then I want to say start easy. Kids don't start with the word refrigerator. It's a very hard word. They try to, s they start with building a base, right? So they start easy and then the, all the concepts that follow are just built upon the building blocks that they have before. So take the time when you want to learn a new concept to really see, do I already understand the concepts on which this is based? And now I don't know who of you guys regularly visit uh, DevOx Belgium but you might recognize this uh, diagram from Stefan. Thank you, Stefan. <laughs> Very nice. No, it's a, it's a really nice diagram and I use it uh, a lot of times because this is, uh, you can find it for all, uh, well, for a lot of um, languages, of course, uh, but it's a diagram with which you can look in what kind of hierarchy or what kind of structure you can start building your knowledge on a certain programming language in this, uh, in this case, Java. Now, we talked about memory stories. We talked about sensory memory, short-term memory, long-term memory. But what we, would, what we didn't talk about yet is this kind of process engine that gets short-term memory into long-term memory. And that is what we call the working memory. Now, researchers, uh, researchers are very debated if the working memory is maybe the same thing as a short-term memory or that they are two different entities. There are two, like, what, what do you want to call it, like, um, beliefs in this matter. And there hasn't been, as far as I know, a concluded uh, or a conclusion on this matter. Um, but I really like it to see it as two separate entities because for my understanding, I find it more clear to have the other things as storages and the working memory as an engine. 
Um, but I do get the conf or like the confusion because the working memory can also only process two to six chunks at a time. Sounds familiar, right? So we've all been there, right? We're reading an article, we're reading, or we're we're trying to find a book, and we're reading through existing code. And at one point, you get so frustrated because you simply don't get it anymore. It's it's just too much to take in at that moment, and and you're almost at that at that point where you want to throw your laptop out of the window. This is what we call cognitive overload. And you can imagine that it can happen quite rapidly if you only have two to six chunks to process at a time. Now, cognitive load is so, um, so uh, true in that matter that if you get to a seven chunk, it's not there. So either you need to drop one of the chunks that you are currently processing, or you can simply not take in the seventh chunk. And with this in mind, I want to step out a little bit from this pre presentation on learning techniques and talk with you guys also about being gentle to yourself or gentle to your colleague, junior, de junior developer. You might just have spent yesterday the entire day on explaining this person how you want to write code, the best practices, uh, design patterns, you name it, and you put all your heart and soul into it, and the next day this person acts <laughs> like he never heard that whole concept. Don't be too hard on that person, especially if it's a junior developer, because cognitive load is a real thing, and it's quite hard to get everything processed at the same time. There's only so much we can do. Now, I, ta I, I told you guys about this forest, and I told when you revisit a number of times, we get a pathway. But what I didn't tell you yet is that we, if we even revisit that enough of times, we can create ourselves some highways. And highways are extremely cool because highways mean that you have automatic retrieval of the data that is stored in your long-term memory, which means that it doesn't take up a chunk in your working memory. You don't need to process it again. It is so automatic, it's, so like it's, it's such a basis fundamental knowledge of you that you don't need to process it and you can just use it to your knowledge. Now, I know nowadays we often say to each other, like, oh, yeah, but we have Google, we have ChatGPT, like, you don't need to learn everything anymore because you have this whole knowledge base where you can find everything. And that is very true, but when you need to Google for stuff, it does take up a chunk in your, long, uh, in your working memory. And therefore, it makes that your understanding of the code base, your understanding of concepts, become harder. And there you can come to that point where you reach a ceiling of how much you can process. And that's the point where you really need to automate stuff that you are Googling for, so that you can make room for new stuff and understandings. Next to that, every time you switch your IDE to Google and stuff, it's also a big challenge to stay on focus, to stay in the flow, to not get distracted by something else you see on the internet. So with that in mind, let's say we want to build some highways, right? Everybody wants them. So how do we do that? How do we make ourselves some highways? Well, the first thing I would say is think before you search or use AI at least when you want to learn something. Because it's like you're standing in front of the forest. You have your pathway, right? But you cannot quite see the end. You can see the first few steps, but like you're not entirely sure. When you're Googling stuff before you really think, it's like you're not even visiting that pathway. You're immediately turning left or right, and you're going to look somewhere else for the answer. So what I recommend you guys is if you want to learn, first 
take a few steps, just write down whatever you know, try to really think like, oh, what was it again that I learned the other day? And then maybe when you're really making an active try, it might even, the path might even come visible to you, leading to a more consolidated path the next time. And maybe not, maybe you cannot see the end and you do need to Google at a certain point, but you did at least take a few steps, making sure that you already, or at least consolidated something of that learning path. The other thing that I recommend is frequency. Who uses the app Duolingo? Nah, I had expected more, but okay, okay, okay. I recommend it, it's a very fun app. And I think the, the greatest benefit of Duolingo is that they have very short lessons, but they trigger you through gamification to revisit it daily. So practice often rather than longer. Just make sure you revisit it and repeat it time after time again. Something else you can do if you want to actively learn some for something is use flashcards. Um, and it works like this, that on one side you have either a visualization or you have a term, and on the other hand, you have whatever it means. Now, we have apps for that. We have MP, uh, Enki and Quizlet. Uh, they are great apps where you can create either your own flashcard decks, but you can also use them from the internet. Um, so uh, a lot of people already spend a lot of time creating uh, flashcard decks. Now, something else you want to do is create hooks, right? We talked about this. You, you all know <laughs> we want to have hooks. So make as many hooks as possible. Try to create a dictionary for yourself. Write down everything you know about a certain concept. Write down monomics, write down visualization, pros and cons, when to use it, when not to use it. And if you want to take that a step further, introduce study time. Study time is a time in the week I, I prefer doing it weekly, where you spend 20 minutes to research. And after those 20 minutes, put it aside. You're going to spend the next week on trying it out. What is important is that at the end of the week, you revisit it. You try to, you look again at what you wrote down initially, and you're going to expand upon that. What did you learn? Were there situations where you haven't thought of yet? Were there situations where you did thought of, but it actually failed? So you're just going to make your understanding bigger. And then if you think you know enough, just see if you are able to explain it to others. Because when you can explain it to others, you're certain that the long-term memory has stored it in such a way that you really understand what you're talking about. Now, learning together, I don't need to tell you guys, you're all at a conference, is of course very important and maybe more importantly even, it's a lot of fun, right? We want to inspire each other. We want to learn from each other because we all, like individually, we only got one few on, th on stuff. So we want to have more stuff. But I have one remark to make and that is the curse of expertise. The curse of expertise is something that happens when you're in software development or another discipline for a couple of years you kind of magically forget where you came from. You kind of forget how hard it was in the beginning, how much cognitive overload you had, and how often you needed to ask for help or Google something. So whenever we learn together, stay humble and, and gentle with each other, remembering that we all came from somewhere. Okay, last part, generative AI. So how does this talk translate to generative AI? We all know tools like Copilot, CoWhisperer, ChatGPT, uh, AI Assistant, but how does it work and is it really beneficial if we look at learning? What implication does it have on learning new stuff? Well, before I want to move into my pro-con list and tell you about like what are the benefits and uh, the contradictions and stuff, 
I want to share this image with you guys. There's a recent white paper, I have it in the sources, I will point it out later. Uh, there's a recent white paper that showed this as an outcome, which I found very interesting. That LLM, so large language models, are more likely than not to break existing code, to introduce bugs at this given moment in time, right? Like, of course, we are all improving stuff. But at this moment in time, if you use generative AI in your IDE and you let them refactor your code, the likelihood of it not breaking and actually being the right refactor is 37%, which is not a lot. So keep that in mind when I now talk about large language models and the implications on learning. So I want to view it from two points of view. So one is the novice point of view and the other is the expert point of view. With novice point of view, I mean the people that are just a few years in the field. So you're still learning a lot. So I think there are a lot of benefits. First of all, uh, it gives you a lot of variety, right? Like when you want to learn about a new concept, as I said with a kid that wants to try out stuff, generative AI gives you a lot of different ways in which you can implement different solutions with the same outcome, which can consolidate your knowledge of that concept. It gives you a lot of access to information and it can reduce your fear of asking questions, maybe asking a dumb question, which doesn't exist, of course, we all know, but you're kind of still, you don't want to ask because what if? You can ask ChatGPT that, like they don't judge, they don't mind. And it's actually very nice in terms of customized learning because where you have university that offers you a curriculum in one level with maybe a little bit of personal attention, JGPT can really like adapt or another, or another tool like generative AI can really adapt to your learning style, to your learning level. Um, so that's, that's all very, very nice. But there are also two big disadvantages. One, if you talk about generative AI, is the reduced memorization. Because it's passive way of learning, right? If I use Copilot as a novice, I'm not letting it run through my fingers. I'm just watching it go. And the chances of me really understanding and really learning about the syntax are way smaller than if I would have really typed it out. The other thing is that with the previous slide in mind, you need to have a good um, judgmental view at your code. The chances are pretty big that there are some flaws in the code. And if you're a novice, it's quite hard to find that. Especially if you remember that you want to prevent unlearning. So what if I use generative AI as a novice and I take everything to be true and later on I need to unlearn that? That's quite inefficient, right? So pros and cons, not a clear answer, sorry for that. Then the expert point of view. Well, first of all, of course, it can offer you great efficiency, like you can skip all the boilerplate, like that will be generated by the generative AI tool, and you can focus on the complex domain-specific knowledge, right, on the, on the task at hand, which is very nice. But what you do need to take in mind to be aware of is that there comes a greater responsibility on reviewing your code. You need to be more present. I've read some articles that say that generative AI is reducing your critical thinking. It might, but I think it should actually improve your critical thinking because you need to be way more aware of what is happening than when you would do it yourself because you are doing what you know, uh, whereas this is leading to a point where you can get lazy quite quickly. So you need to stay critical, uh, you, you need to um, activate your critical thinking quite a lot. Uh, reduce creativity, 
it depends. It can be like if you like simply lazily just accept all the all the suggestions, then it can be reduced creativity. On the other hand, you can focus on domain specific logic and stuff, so maybe that improves creativity a bit. And security risks, of course, we all, I think, read about some security risks. So what is my answer? What do I think? Do I think it's a benefit we should or we shouldn't? I don't think it's one of the other, sorry for that, but I do think we need to be very aware of the implications. Like we need to be aware that our job at hand is switching and that there's a greater responsibility on reviewing, guiding novice people, really keeping each other sharp, what is, what is right, what is wrong, what are our core principles, what are our best practices, stuff like that. And then with the last thing I wanted to, uh, to say before I'm, I'm rounding up is that generative AI is more, has more to do with transactive memory. We talked about memory a lot during this talk and transactive memory is that you are not exactly learning a, s a certain concept, but you're learning where you can retrieve that information. And we've been doing that since the beginning of time. It started in the Stone Age where we just simply held each other accountable, right? I don't need to learn everything. I can ask my neighbor how to cook a bread or something or how to find a deer to hunt it. And then later we found the alphabet writing, we wrote stuff down, we could look things up in books. Of course we're not reading, or we, of course we're not learning a book entirely like all the books we want to know. We know where to find them, we know how to read them. And then at CERN, actually, the World Wide Web was introduced, giving us again way bigger um, um, knowledge base than we had before where we can retrieve it. So our transactive memory was growing again. And now we're at the start for mainstream using AI. And that's again another transactive memory, right? We are learning again where we can find more information that we don't know, to, that we don't have to know by heart, but where we can find it. And I don't know where this ends, maybe this ends somewhere in being a cyborg or anything. Um, <laughs> it, can, it can all happen. Um, I don't think we necessarily need to be scared of this um, and that we grow dumber by using this. We have always um, grow throughout time uh, our transactive memory. We just have extra storage for other things that happen around us and that will become clearer in time, whatever that may be. So for today's talk, I have a few key takeaways. First off, try to use creative contextual association. Try to use as many senses as you can in your learning. Actively apply what you learn. Don't just read or copy paste. Find someone that can correct you. Pairing up is always a good idea. It keeps each other sharp and you inspire each other. Automate your long-term memory retrieval. Of course, you can find anything on Google or ChatGPT, but you become smarter if you automate it yourself. Learn together and be aware of how and when to use generative AI. With that being said, these are my sources. The second one is actually the white paper that just came out. So if you, ha if you found that uh, graph interesting, uh, that is the source. Um, and that's it. Thank you for your, your attention and uh, hope to see you tomorrow.